Hi, my name is Drayton Michaels from PitbullGuru.com and I'm presenting this short video today to dispel the myth that pit bulls in some way need harsh, fearful, or painful training in order to train them as they're more difficult. This is simply not true. Pit bull dogs are easy to train just like any dog when you use kind, consistent training and positive reinforcement. There's no need for a heavy hand or any use of fear and pain. You'll see in this video, as experts and dog owners agree, it's all about how dogs are treated, trained, and maintained. If we want to have dogs be well-behaved members of our society, then dog owners must be educated legitimately and dogs must be treated properly. This way, dogs remain sound and our assessments of them remain sane. Uh, for me, the dividing line um, between how we're training a dog, what, what I like to call dog-friendly dog training, and ways which are unacceptable, is if the dog's in pain or if he's scared. The, I view that both of these things are unnecessary in training. You have to punish in training. You have to let the dog know that was right, that was cool, you know, I'm rewarding you, I want to reinforce that behavior, I want you to do it again. And then we have to punish you in the sense of saying, no, I don't want that type of behavior. So that's what I mean by a punishment. A punishment is just meant to be, I, 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 I would define it, um, tautologically that basically uh, punishment should be punishing it does not have to be uh, painful or fearful and because it doesn't have to be I personally think it shouldn't because it means it's actually trainers choice whether they decide to make their punishment uh, painful or fearful. my dividing line is not with the whole issue of whether or not we punish it's what is the nature of the punishment and, and I don't think we should hurt the dog in training um, and I don't think we should make him afraid. Well I think that dogs oftentimes usually behave the way they behave because of the way that they've been brought up. Dogs are very loyal and they try to please the people that feed them and care for them and that they bond with. Basically they, they, they only know what you can teach them, you know, that's, that's, they don't know right from wrong unless they're tough. I think the sort of phobia we have of rewards that somehow rewarding animals is somehow corrupting them. That it's much, much better that it's somehow good for animals, it's good for children, it's good for everybody to kind of have bad things happen to you. Uh, and that in fact if you reward behavior, then somehow you're softening somebody up, you're destroying their character. You're somehow having them do it for, for less noble reasons. I mean, and from a behavior mod modification standpoint, this is catastrophic. Because basically you're handcuffing yourself from competent execution of any basic training or behavior modification. And so where dogs end up sort of uh, the victims of this mentality that um, we don't need to motivate them. They, they are born with this innate motivation. Um, and so uh, if the, some individual dog does not innately just want to do what you ask him to do, that particular animal is defective and therefore has a comeuppance coming to him, which is really, really, if you think about it, just Orwellian. I mean, and to sort of say, well, you know, we don't really need to motivate the animal uh, and then end up, of course, forcing them, which is another brand of motivation. Uh, so I think one thing that would really help not only dog training, but society, in general, sort of acknowledging that um, you know, properly functioning living organisms do not do anything for nothing. There is no free lunch and behavior. There's no free lunch and behavior modification. Whenever the gloves come off and you actually have to modify behavior, out come the motivators. Um, if you look at everything from um, you know the developmentally disabled education to animal training to child rearing, any time when act, you know when the chips are down and we actually do have to change behavior, out come the real motivators. We do have to do that. Um, it's only kind of in the popular dog sort of sphere where this myth keeps floating around that somehow dogs are just automatically going to do things. But I mean, I've got news for you. Dogs are properly functioning living organisms like all other animals, and they will not do something for nothing. So it is very normal to have to motivate dogs. The question then becomes, do you want to do it with force? Do you want to do it with rewards? Um, and people then vote with their feet. Uh, I think that's a very valid discussion that we could be having. What I think that impedes this discussion from being clear is those who are opting to motivate with force are not owning it. They're not saying that they're motivating with force. They're cloaking it in euphemism. They're cloaking it in all kinds of woo language, um, which really retards any kind of intelligent discussion about, okay, so how shall we motivate dogs? 
I mean, it is currently still legal to do all kinds of things to dogs, but it was actually, you know, 20, 30 years ago, legal to do to children. Um, and the way society is progressing, I mean, eventually some of this stuff will be illegal. But for the time being, anything goes. Um, and so consumers need to be really careful um, about assessing how dog trainers motivate dogs. And they should run, not walk, from anybody who, who doesn't speak frankly about the way they're going to motivate the animal. So in other words, to be a good um, consumer, you need to uh, quiz any dog trainer and say, how are you planning to motivate my dog? And if you don't get a straight answer, I'm going to force your dog, I'm going to frighten your dog, I'm going to scare your dog, I'm going to reward your dog with food, I'm going to reward your dog with toys and games, etc. If you get anything that sounds the slightest bit sort of dodgy, then I would say run, don't walk. It's just basically a trainer who's advertising incompetence. It's a very effective way to instill a couple of subsets of ritualistic behavior. The problem is that those dogs never trust you and they become unreliable. Um, this is what happens when you train with either shock or punishment. You can teach the dog to not do something. They'll avoid it. So don't look at me, don't go somewhere. They'll learn that because it, fa it fits right in with how the amygdala protects you from the rest of, of life's bad events. But what they won't be able to do is to learn alternatives for how to deal with that. Um, so we often see that police dogs, for example, there's a phenomenal peer-reviewed study that shows that um, Dutch police dogs who are trained with shock learn to not do certain things when they're with their handlers. So they learn to always just monitor the handler's behavior and only move the way the handler's moving. But in order to do that, they're always checking back. Their ears are always back, they're always looking back. They can do their job, but they never trust the handler. And you compare those with dogs who are trained without shock, who are also successful police dogs, and they don't do any of those insecure behaviors because they've never been taught to be afraid of their handler. And until that study was done, the handlers didn't realize that what they taught the dog to do was not respect them, but fear them. The dog was capable enough, these were super dogs. They could do their job, but they were never comfortable doing it. Now when you're asking to train something that's going to be new for an animal, um, in order for you to be able to make molecular memory, you have to be awake enough to be paying attention and interested enough to be paying attention, but not so stressed that you're afraid. If you've kicked your cortisol, your stress hormone level, over into the red zone so that you're beginning to be fearful, that's a great way to learn a characteristic fear. Oh my God, the house is burning, I have to get out. Great, you've learned that response. But you haven't exactly learned how to prevent the fire. Now if what we want you to do is learn complex things, like if you sit down and look at me, we can learn how to take you over this agility jump. Um, you have to be awake, you have to be paying attention, so you need a little bit of cortisol. But if you're terrified of what's gonna happen if you don't do it, the cortisol actually acts as a hormone response element and prohibits you from making molecular memory. So you have to question the sanity of using pop quizzes to get people to learn the material in class because if all they're thinking about is, oh my God, I'm gonna be tested, oh my God, I'm gonna be tested, they may acquire a few things to get them through that test in the short term, but they're not doing the type of integrative learning we want them to do because they're too stressed. And the same thing is true for dogs. If we get them to the point where they're upset, if they're panting, if their ears are back, if they're scanning the environment, if they're always going from side to side, or their ears and eyes are always moving around, that dog's too stressed to learn what we need to tell them. And if we can instead teach them to sit and take a deep breath and relax their muscles, but still be interested, now we're at a place where their cortisol level is just sufficient that they can acquire new memories and stimulate the brain chemicals and the, the um, elements responsible for this, that they'll turn on their molecular memory machinery and they'll make new memories of how to learn the appropriate things we want them to learn. But if we scare them, we've completely blocked that. And what they get is that, okay, I know what it takes to not be injured anymore, but now I can't learn to offer you anything else. Which is why when people always say to me, 
I don't know why you're so opposed to, you know, punishing or shocking the dog. Um, I put a shock collar on my dog and my dog stopped barking. Well, what your dog did was he stopped pretty much doing anything. If you look at these dogs, they stop offering behaviors. Yeah, he stopped barking and he's also stopped having a great time. You know, we have a you know, sort of saying in our behavior clinic um, here at Tufts Coming School that aggression begets aggression. So if you train using confrontational, you know, aggressive uh, approaches, if you're prepared to risk life and limb, you can occasionally make a point that for a fleeting moment looks like, you know, you very quickly turn the situation around. But the long-term effect is, you know, building a negative relationship with the dog increasing aggression down the road and uh, you know those techniques are you know, actually training techniques of yesteryear they should not be applied to dogs today and especially not dogs who might you know fight back and not accept uh, really what is a type of abuse you know as with all dogs my thing is they need training you know you gotta train your dogs and... if anything dogs are the quintessential species that were, that probably co-evolved and in the worst case scenario were domesticated to truly work with us in a cooperative sense. So they should have those constructs of not needing to threaten. The whole idea of dominance um, is actually a bad interpretation of the classical literature which restricted the use of dominance as a terminology and a concept to who was the most successful breeder in the group, which often turned out to be the oldest individual, but not always, um, the most experienced individual. It might have been the individual who knew where most risks were. And it's been not only misapplied in um, the pet dog literature, but it's actually been misused in a lot of the recent scientific literature. And um, all of the training ideas that say you have to dominate the dog you know, even our military doesn't do that with their troops. And as we've learned more about how people learn and how they build bonds and are willing to work with each other, our military has even shifted to saying what we're doing is we're building up relationships. Um, when all we did was build, you know, tore people down, they discovered they were doing damage. So this whole idea that you dominate something to get them to cooperate, it just actually uh, doesn't hold doesn't hold scientific water. That's the construct of deference. You know, it's based on what your talents are and what you know. So in fact, your dogs are always looking to you for um, guidance, not control. And I think when people say you have to dominate the dog, um, it says a lot more about the human than it says about the individual dog. Thanks for watching this video about the dangers of using fear and pain to train dogs. Remember, dog training has as much to do with human behavior as it does with dog behavior. Human behavior is the biggest variable in the dog's overall soundness. By making sure human behavior is ethical, kind, consistent, and non-violent, we build sound, reliable dogs that feel safe about their environment most of the time. A non-fear, non-pain approach to dog training is how we can be even more assured that dogs and humans are building bonds and not binds and everyone is proceeding safely. If you would like to find out more about proper ways to train dogs, please visit pitbullguru.com for more info. This has been a Canine Sun Media presentation.